This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 135. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Dragonfly mission to Titan, the Hubble Space Telescope back online following its latest shutdown, and China launching more spy satellites as it continues preparing for war. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has decided to move forward with its Dragonfly mission to explore the chemistry and habitability of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan is the second biggest moon in the solar system, eclipsed only by Ganymede. In fact, it's larger than the planet Mercury. The 5,150-kilometre-wide world is some 50% larger than the Earth's moon and 80% more massive. Also, it's the only world in our solar system other than Earth where clouds rain liquid onto the ground, forming streams and rivers, which eventually flow into lakes and seas. But unlike the Earth's water-based hydrological cycle, Titan's rains are made of liquid methane and ethane. On Titan, temperatures are so cold, water is frozen so hard it forms the bedrock. Titan's atmosphere is about 10 times as thick as that on Earth. But like Earth's atmosphere, it's primarily nitrogen. But because it's also laced with methane and ethane, it forms a dense hydrocarbon haze high in the moon's stratosphere, where the molecules are destroyed by sunlight. NASA says the Dragonfly mission will launch in 2026 and should arrive at Titan in 2034. Much like Mars Ingenuity, the autonomously operated Dragonfly will be a rotocopter. It'll explore dozens of sites, investigating the moon's surface and shallow subsurface, looking for organic molecules and possibly biosignatures. To carry out its mission, Dragonfly will be equipped with a neutron spectrometer, a drill system and a mass spectrometer, allowing scientists to make detailed surveys of Titan's chemical makeup. It sounds funny, but with its methane seas and orange smog, Titan in some ways is the most similar world to Earth that we've found so far. Although it's merely a moon tethered by gravity to its cosmic ruler Saturn, Titan has all the trappings of a planet, including clouds, rain, lakes and rivers, even a subsurface ocean of salty water. It was Dutch astronomer Christopher Huygens who discovered Titan back in 1655. He simply called it Luna Saturni, or Saturn's moon. It was later renamed after a group of mythical Greek deities called Titans. Scientists got their first real close-up view of Titan when NASA's Cassini spacecraft spent 13 years exploring the Saturnian system. During that time, Cassini undertook some 127 close flybys of Titan. And importantly, Cassini also deployed the European Space Agency's Huygens lander, which descended through Titan's atmosphere in 2005, eventually touching down on the surface, which it described is feeling like wet sand. Dragonfly will study Titan's thick opaque atmosphere, which is four times denser than Earth's. This dense atmosphere, combined with Titan's far lower gravity, just a seventh that of the Earth, and its frigid temperature of minus 179 degrees Celsius, means flying over Titan will require far less energy than what the Mars Ingenuity rotocopter uses when flying over the red planet. In fact, NASA mission managers expect Dragonfly to travel more than 160 kilometres over its three-Earth-year mission. And that will be almost double the distance travelled by all the Mars rovers combined. This report from NASA TV. Saturn's largest moon, Titan, has a thick atmosphere and a frozen surface rich in organic molecules. In 2034, a NASA mission called Dragonfly will arrive at Titan and study its chemical makeup. Dragonfly is a rotorcraft designed to visit multiple sites across the moon's varied terrain. At each new landing site on Titan's surface, Dragonfly uses a pulsed neutron generator and onboard gamma ray sensor to detect key elements such as carbon and hydrogen in organic materials or oxygen in water ice. 
Dragonfly determines if there are well-defined layers of these materials just below the lander. For a closer inspection, Dragonfly uses its drill to generate tailings from Titan's hard, frozen surface. These surface samples can then be ingested through the pneumatic system, carried with Titan air into the chilled sample lines and to the sample collection carousel. One of the carousel sample cups is placed in a pneumatic port. The cup captures the surface material from the cold air stream and transfers it to the chemical laboratory for measurement. Pulses from a laser release large organic molecules from the surface sample for analysis in the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer sorts molecules by mass and measures diagnostic fragments that tell Dragonfly the kinds of chemical components that are present in the surface and whether there are molecules of prebiotic interest. For those potential prebiotic samples, a new cup is placed into an oven and heated to release molecules into a gas chromatograph where they are sorted for size and type before entering the mass spectrometer. This advanced separation of organic components includes isolating molecules with the same formula but different chiral arrangements, or handedness. Having a preference for one handedness over another is a key biosignature for life on Earth. When the chemical analysis is complete, Dragonfly may choose to take another surface sample or find a new location on Titan to investigate. This is space time. Still to come, the Hubble Space Telescope back online following its latest shutdown, and another 53 Starlink satellites launched by SpaceX. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Earth-orbiting Hubble Space Telescope's partially back online after mission managers successfully recovered the observatory's advanced camera for survey's instrument. However, all is not back to normal, with other scientific instruments still in safe mode, as NASA continues to try and understand the loss of synchronization issues which triggered the latest shutdown last month. The advanced camera for surveys instrument was the first to be recovered as it faces the fewest complications should another lost message signal occur. Over the past week, technicians have been continuing their investigations to try and work out the root cause of these synchronization issues. Now, no additional problems have been found so far, and NASA mission managers are considering bringing other instruments back online in order to resume scientific operations. The Science Instruments entered a safe mode configuration back on October the 25th. It happened after onboard computers detected a loss of specific data synchronization. Technicians have been focusing their attention on hardware in the Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. They're analysing the circuitry of the control unit, which generates the synchronization messages and then passes them on to the individual instruments. While analysing the control unit, engineers are also working out how to identify potential workarounds for the issue. These include possible changes to instrument flight software that could check for these lost messages and then compensate for them without putting instruments into safe mode. However, the workarounds would first need to be verified using ground simulators to ensure that they work as planned. Right now, technicians are working to turn on parts of the near-infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer instrument. That will allow them to collect additional data, which will tell them how often the synchronization problems occurring. Installed back in 1997, the near-infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer has been inactive since 2010 when the Wide Field Camera 3 became operational. But it would allow technicians to collect information on these lost messages while at the same time keeping the active instruments off as a safety precaution. Only time will tell to see whether or not it works but we'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. Still to come, another 53 Starlink satellites launched by SpaceX. And later in the science report, paleontologists have identified a new species of hadrosaur dinosaur on the Isle of Wight. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
SpaceX has launched another 53 Starlink satellites as it continues to expand its broadband internet constellation. The flight from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida brings the total number of Starlink satellites now in orbit to 1,844. An incredible amount. The Falcon 9 first stage successfully returned to Earth following the flight, landing on the drone ship just read the instructions, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Each of the 260 kg spacecraft are equipped with KU, KA and E-band phased array antennas. SpaceX plans to eventually have more than 30,000 of these satellites in operation. And that's something which is alarming astronomers who warned that the streaks and trains of satellites these are creating across the skies is seriously hampering crucial scientific research. So far, SpaceX have done a lot of talking about what they're going to do to resolve the issue, but they haven't actually done anything other than keep launching more of the satellites. This is Space Time. China is continuing its spy satellite launch program at a blistering pace, with three more Yogang-35 reconnaissance satellites blasting into orbit. The latest trio were flown aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China. Chinese state-run media described the Yogang 35A, B and C as being designed for scientific experiments, land and resource surveys, agricultural production estimates and disaster relief and mitigation work. In reality, they're military spy satellites, with the Yogang 35A and B being high-resolution imaging satellites, while the Yogang 35C is either a radar satellite or a signals intelligence gathering satellite. All three spacecraft have been deployed into a 500-kilometre high orbit. The flight was China's 43rd orbital launch this year. In fact, China now has over 439 satellites orbiting the Earth. Since 2016, Beijing's launched more than 147 Earth observation satellites. They're designed to provide near-continuous high-resolution monitoring of areas of interest to China including at least 32 Gaofeng and some 89 Yaogang spy satellites. Last week, Beijing threatened to attack Australian defence facilities if Canberra assisted the United States in defending Taiwan from Chinese invasion of the territory. It follows earlier threats to use nuclear weapons against Japan if Tokyo came to Taiwan's assistance. Currently, the Pentagon estimates that China will attempt its invasion of Taiwan within the next six years. Of course, the first Australia will know about such an invasion is when places like Alice Springs and the Northwest Cape suddenly go silent. The Yogang 35 launch follows the successful launch a few days earlier of the Guanmu SDG Sat-1 spacecraft. The satellite was launched aboard a Long March 6 rocket from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Jiangxi province. The spacecraft is equipped with three imaging payloads, a thermal infrared imager, a low light level imager and a multi-spectral imager. These provide a 300 km wide data acquisition capability allowing global coverage every 11 days. The 740 kg spacecraft was placed into a 505 km high orbit. This is Space Time. Time now to take another look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Nuclear physicists have used an array of almost 200 lasers the size of three football fields to successfully fuse hydrogen atoms into helium. The experiment at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's National Ignition Facility in California generated a mega blast of power, eight times greater than they had ever achieved before the research could eventually lead to a clean, inexhaustible source of nuclear energy. Nuclear fusion is the process which powers stars, releasing energy as atoms are fused together. It's different from the nuclear fission process used in existing nuclear power stations, which generate their energy by splitting atoms apart. Laser fusion ignition is one of two ways of generating nuclear fusion energy. The other involves devices called tokamaks or stellarators. 
They work by heating plasma confined by magnetic fields in a donut-shaped reactor. The goal of both methods is to eventually generate more energy than what it takes to produce the reaction. International researchers say the expansion of China's high-speed rail network between 2008 and 2016 has led to a significant reduction in the country's transport sector carbon emissions. A report in the journal Nature Climate Change found that the changeover has led to annual reductions in greenhouse gas emissions equal to 14.76 million tonnes of CO2, which is 1.75% of China's total transport sector emissions. And with Australia heading for a federal election next year, that perennial carrot of high-speed rail should be making its regular pre-election appearance any time now. Both sides of Australian politics constantly promise to build it, but then conveniently forget once they're elected. Paleontologists have identified a new species of hadrosaur dinosaur on the Isle of Wight. The new herbivore, reported in the journal Systematic Paleontology, has been named Brightonensis simonzi. Based on its remarkably large nasal bone, the newly discovered Cretaceous period hadrosaur has an unusually large nose compared to other related species such as Iguanodon. Movie devotees say they've come up with a way to scientifically gauge the scariest horror movies of all time. The trouble is, they've left out some of the really good ones. For example, the severed head dropping during Hooper's dive in Jaws. The creeper removing a javelin when standing on top of the school bus in Cheapest Creepers 2. The embryo arriving as that unwanted dinner guest in Alien. Or the old priest staring at the face of evil on the mounds of the ruined city in The Exorcist. With the details of how this new horror film science works, we're joined by Tim Mendham, from Australian Skeptics. A group that uh, was, was from an internet streaming company wired up some people and showed them some films and they just tracked their heart rates, their beats per minute, which is normally about 64, one beat a second, and they ranked them and they saw ha- how much their heart rate increased when they were watching a particular film and what was the highest point. When, when, when did they really get a scare? Obviously, when someone jumped out from a dark corridor, how high did their uh, heart rate go then? A spike. We don't know how many people they tested. Okay, so it's a, it's a bit of a problem there. But, I mean, but the... Films were generally fairly new films, uh, which are probably, uh, like you, annoys me that uh, they don't go back far enough. They don't have a lot of history. Most of these films would have been in this century, apart from a couple like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and that sort of stuff, which are perennials on these lists. So, but the, but the of their 20, which was The Conjuring 3 was the number 20, and that got 76 beats per minute, a spike of 106. So it's a bit higher than normal. They go up to the very highest one, which was uh, a fairly recent film called Host, which I had to look up, which got to 88 beats per minute and 130 beats per minute on the spike rate. So that's a film about uh, kids who go on to Zoom and hire a, a, a psychic or something to get in touch with someone and it all gets out of hand. It's one of those films where all the young people get, get their just for <laughs> doing silly things. But like you, yeah, it's an, it's, it's all these lists of horror films and scary films, they always get annoyed that they leave out some classics. The Exorcist, for example, probably the greatest horror movie ever made, I would have thought. Yes, yeah, yeah. But they don't get the old ones the old scary films with you know, the old 1930s Frankenstein films. They don't have a film called The Haunting. This is the early 60s, 63, I think it is, which is a brilliantly scary film without any monster or anything. It's so scary, so tense. Um, and it's directed by Robert Wise, who made Sound of Music, which is an interesting contrast. Another film from the early 70s called um, The Haunting of Hill House, I think it's called. Yes. Um, yeah, I remember something like that. that, which is also very scary. But I mean, yeah, so, so this list is sort of like a lot of these lists is only about um, films from the last 20 years or so. So it's obviously done by young people who don't have a sense of history like you and me do. Yeah, but even with the more recent horror movies like Jeepers Creepers and Jeepers Creepers 2, they won't mention and they surely should have been, or I would have thought so anyway. Where's Ginger Snaps? Well, yes, exactly. Where's Pumpkinhead? I can't help it. I, I like horror films just as much as you do, but there's, uh, there's a lot of films. There's a lot of horror films around, actually, especially recently. It's been a big, uh, big successful genre, but uh, they're not all of the same quality. Now, most of these rely on the fact of uh, this heartbreak spike where something suddenly happens and someone jumps out at you, right? Yeah, but, but wouldn't you get that in a suspense movie as well? Yeah, well, there, there's a, you, you do. I mean, you, you get it in a Hitchcock film. And uh, there's a certain sense of tension. You have to have a bit of a background 
level of tension. And when something jumps out at you and you leap out of your seat, that's when you get a spike. But it's a bit of a cheap... Psycho. There's another one talking about Hitchcock. That's right. I know. So yes, Psycho, Hitchcock invented the, the slasher film concept. You know, it was the first time you get this sort of screaming soundtrack of someone being knifed, etc., and the, the continual horror. And that, that built up suspense, as Hitchcock was you know, the master of. And that also had these sort of scare moments, which would have, would have had people's heart rate racing up, yeah. uh, I think. But no, yeah, not listed. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 